I was about to say good afternoon. Good, still good morning. Uh, welcome to my presentation. As you know from yesterday, my name is David Cox, and I will be talking with you today about converting from HTML to PDF, but via a web app. Now, for many decades, well, for a number of decades, the users in the forum have been asking for PDF capability to be supplied by Zojo. We have our data in our applications on our screens, but the customer wants a PDF version of that data. And now we have PDF built into Zojo. So all of our problems are solved, right? Not necessarily. Because I don't just want PDF from my screen, I want PDF from about at least five different locations. I want a PDF from a raw, H, uh, a raw URL. Send it a URL, I want a PDF of that. Uh, I, want to take, well, I want to take some raw HTML and get a PDF of that. I have a picture on the screen, I want a PDF. I have a row set from a database, I want a PDF. I have a list box on the screen, I want to export that to a PDF. Now, all of those areas that I just mentioned, I can convert into HTML. So I want URL and HTML to PDF. Now that's a great move to add this to our application. But the question is, how? From my investigations, there are six main choices that we have for PDF, to build PDF available to Sojo, Zojo developers. So the first one is, of course, the built-in PDF libraries provided by Zojo. <coughs> They can take any of the objects that we have on screen and turn it into a PDF. And the great thing is, there's no plugin involved at all. You just automatically get it. No cost, no database, uh, like plugin size in megabytes or anything like that. So it's a, it's, it's a good capability there. Second one, all of these screens, by the way, I've given Christian a copy of the keynote and all of the code I'm doing today, so you will have access to it all. Second one, DynaPDF from MBS works in a similar fashion, and it gives you even more capabilities than the Zojo PDF, but it has a size overhead with the plugin in your application, and of course, there's the cost overhead. Uh, within it. Now both of these solutions are very good in that <coughs> they will work with pretty much any of the app stores. If you build your app and put it into one of the, uh, one of the app stores, Apple App Store or Microsoft App Store, they will accept it no trouble because what you're doing is all within your one main application. Now these Two might be all that you need. But as I said before, I need two additional things. I need to be able to take a URL and give it to and get a PDF, and I need raw HTML to PDF. Why? Why do I need those two? The reason I need those two is that all of my I build my help into my application, but the help itself a data, I have a database on a, on a host which says what all the help information is and the actual display that I put into my application is not actually inside the app, it's, it's hosting that page. So that when somebody searches for help or if I'm in a co certain context in my application and help displays, what it's displaying is a URL of uh, of, of help information. So I want the people to not just be able to see that on the screen, but click an export to PDF button, they can download that help any time that they want. The other reason why I need those capabilities is that I have other things as well. 
I have an invoicing program with a graffiti suite uh, HTML editor, so I get raw HTML out of that for building um, uh, invoices that you might want to attach to emails. Uh, I also use, as I mentioned, list boxes, but I have uh, calendar support in some applications, timeline support, you know, Gantt chart type of things. So while these two are good, they, they don't give me all the things that I need. Now, the best alternative that I've found to convert just a URL or raw HTML to PDF is a thing called WK HTML to PDF. It's free, it's cross-platform, but it's only cross-platform on Macintosh and, uh, and Windows. Uh, and Linux, sorry. The trouble is, it's no good. It, it won't help me with mobile, either Android or iOS. So, the other problem with it is it's big. Depending on whether it's Mac, Windows or Linux, it adds up to 120 megabytes of space to my, to my application, which is a lot. The other problem is that to use it, I need to run a shell command to go off and call it as a, as a helper application, build the PDF, and then, get, then uh, build it to a folder item, and then I get the result back. So there's a question as to whether I can include that in an app store where well, I've got a third-party application in there. OK. Number four, Graffiti Suite came out with a capability called HTML Exporter. It wasn't a separate plugin. It was built in a number of libraries. It seemed to be able to work completely cross-platform. The problem for it was that it doesn't create a normal PDF. It creates a raster, a, bit, a bitmap image of a PDF, which the biggest problem is that the PDF file sizes are now absolutely huge in comparison with a, a text-based PDF. And the other problem is I think Anthony has actually deprecated it, so it's, it's a dead, dead end. Another product is that you can run a Chrome shell. <coughs> so if you have you know, a Chrome on your computer, whether it's Microsoft Edge, whether it's Google, um, uh, their, their spreadsheet, you can actually send off a URL or HTML to Chrome uh, as a command line, get it to do its work, and, uh, and return you with a PDF. Uh, I also use that capability to add a print function within my application. So I can go, so that I can put a print button up in the menus, go print. Uh, you take the raw HTML that you want. You can put some JavaScript before at the start at the end, and what the when the Safari or Edge launches, it's going to see that JavaScript. So in other words, it display it quickly launches Safari, displays uh, the the print uh, dialog. You go, you change the settings, hit OK, and the other JavaScript at the end says that when it's finished doing its printing or saving to a PDF or whatever they want to do, it then quits out uh, Safari or Edge or whatever it is. So that capability works well. Finally, there is uh, one of the iOS extensions is this thing called HTML to PDF XC. Works well, but it's, it's only on mobile, it's only, sorry, even mobile, it's only on iOS. So what you can see, I've got so many X's in the boxes that I don't have one solution meets all of my requirements. So, I'm gonna go through some of my issues, but please tell me if any of these might be issues for you. So, is it a problem if you have multiple PDF technologies in your application to do the same PDF task? For me, that would be a problem. Maybe you go, I don't mind. I'll use this capability here and a different one there. Is this a problem for you whether you need just single platform? Maybe you only do desktop apps. Not a problem. I don't care about web. 
or maybe you don't do mobile. Maybe that's not an issue. Next one, does consistency matter? So if you're using very different technologies to develop your PDFs, if it wraps different ways, looks differently, fonts different, is that a problem for you, for the person who use, loads the desktop versus the web version, or maybe they're on a Mac on a PC using, using different technology? Does consistency matter or you go, look, I'm creating invoices, they must look exactly the same, whichever environment I'm using. Another one, special fonts. So if you do need special fonts to perform particular functions, is that going to be an issue for you? Are there requirements? Maybe your client doesn't have um, Edge or Safari or whatever it is on your computer, so you're going to have to get them to change their computer. Is, your, is an increased app size a problem for you? If you go, ah, my customers don't matter if I add another 120 megabytes to my application size, not a problem. Others may go, yes, that is going to be an issue. App Store entry. You may go, I'm, I, don't use, I don't put my applications in the App Store, that isn't going to be a problem. For others, that might be a problem. And finally, future proof. Is that technology that you're using going to be around and continue to be developed in five, ten years' time? Okay, so what's my solution? Well, I've already mentioned some of it, and that is that to make HTML the base of the base document for your particular document formats. The great thing about it is HTML is nice and small, it's portable, you can display it on the screen, you can send it to a printer, you can save it to a file, it can be exported to pretty much anything, you can save it in a database. So I think HTML should be the basis of your PDF creation. So therefore what I would suggest you do is remove all PDF generation from your application itself. Okay, <clears throat> now, why? Why am I suggesting removing all the PDF generation from your app? Because I think you should do all the PDF generation on a web app instead, via a URL connection. Because I don't want to have to ma uh, manage many different technologies for generating PDF when I can just use one. I want to generate PDFs from every application I create, not just my first application, but every application I create, and across platform. I don't care if, I, if I'm doing a desktop app, a web app, a mobile app, a Raspberry Pi app, this gives me all of those capabilities. If I have a new special font that I need for, for invoices, I can put it on the server once, it's now available you know, for, for everybody. Testing is easier, test it in one location, it's done. I don't need to ask the client to install any special software, it's just PDF is, is done uh, on the server. I don't have an increased app size at all and I'm never going to be rejected by uh, an app store because you, you know, URL connection is, is a, a standard piece of technology. No helper apps. Finally, I mean, HTML and PDF are essentially future-proof. Even if the technology that I use on the host, on my host web server changes, well, that's very easy. I can change the, ser the host server and the, the users, they don't know or care. If I happen to be on my host changing it from WKHTML to using Chromium to, to do the, the change, it, none of my applications break, everything still continues. Now, that's all the upside. What's the downside of doing the PDF generation on the host? The downside is I now have to maintain a hosted web app. You may go, I don't want to do that. Well, then you can't use this technique. Okay, so how does it work? Okay, it works by you generate your HTML on your PC, you send it off to the web app, and it sends back your PDF. 
even if you're on the mobile, it uses exactly the same technique. Send off to the, to the web server, the REST web server, and it returns a PDF. When I'm on a browser, exactly the same. Send off HTML to the web app, web app talking to web app, and now we return a PDF. Exactly the same PDF is returned from exactly the same HTML. And it'll work with multiple different apps. Just because this might be the same app you're using, if you develop a second, third, or fourth app, it, the, the box in the middle doesn't care what, what your application is, where it's come from. All it's doing is converting HTML to a PDF and turning it back to you. Now, what's this thing on the right-hand side? Some of my PDFs, particularly for my help files, but might be other areas as well, have lots of graphic, high resolution graphics in them. And so when I create a PDF, that can, sometimes that PDF might be very large, might be 20 megabytes in size. Now that could be a problem for your URL connection, not sending the HTML up, it's tiny, and it just has links to the graphics, so, so it's very quick, but sending 20 megabytes of data back down to your computer might be a bit slow. So what I've done is I've done this last little bit where I can tell it to send the PDF up to a database which is on the same machine. It then sends an ID of what the record in the database is down to my computer and depending on which, which one I'm on. So once I get the ID back from the, from the web server, here's the, here, your, your 20 megabyte file is sitting inside as a field inside the database in Base64 format. And I can go, okay, well, let me talk to the database, get that ID, download the PDF to my computer at my leisure, bring it down a chunk at a time, and then display it for the user as before. So even if you create very large uh, PDFs, everything should, should work well. Okay, the sausage factory. What is actually happening behind the scenes? So first of all, excuse me if my German is wrong, I just did Google Translate. I, I hope that is correct. So what do I start with? So I start with a URL. And if it doesn't have HTTP or HTTPS on the front, I go and append it because my REST app needs to know, hey, this is a, this is a, a URL that it's got. Uh, if it's raw HTML, that's fine. If I'm sending a picture, it will convert it to a PNG and then wrap some uh, HTML around it to make it into normal HTML, which you can print. If it's a list box, I actually convert a list box to a row set because I first created a row set, pro, a row set to HTML conversion. So, so that way, I that, again, all I'm doing is either sending a URL or HTML. So that then gets sent off to, uh, I build a dictionary. I build a dictionary of the parameters because sometimes I need to tell it additional things. Do you want a header? Do you want a footer? Do you want a four size? Do you want letter, head so letter size? That sort of thing. So I create a dictionary of parameters. I then convert that dictionary. This is still happening on your local application. I convert a dictionary to JSON. I then send that JSON. I add that JSON into the URL connection, into the set request content. I then send that up to the web app and it receives that JSON as a handle URL event. Now I'm off my, app, my local application, now I'm on the, the REST web app. So the REST web app goes and looks up that JSON and extracts the URL or the HTML from the JSON, so it's got it as, as it was sent. It then converts the URL or the HTML to a PDF. In my case, I'm using WKHTML to PDF. It then 
takes that PDF and does a base64 on it and turn and turns it back into a JSON the, as one of the fields in the JSON. The reason it does that is that I might include other things like whether there are any errors or what the error might be or, or any other any other issues that, uh, that that I want to put in returning. So it returns that to the user via a web response write command. We now that now sends that back to the user. The user receives that, extracts the PDF from the JSON field, and then does whatever the you the you want to do with it. Maybe it saves it to a folder item. Maybe it you just launch it on the screen. It's entirely up to you. Okay, so those are the steps that get involved. Now, how does it work? What does it look like? So I have created, and you have access to this, uh, you have a, first of all, I'm going to show you it as a desktop. So we have a URL up the top there that we can export. I've got some raw HTML for one of my help pages we can export. I've just got a plain picture, and I've got a list box here which just generates random data in there. So we are going to be sending it across to the web app here. Not only the desktop, but we have a web version of exactly the same information. And I've built it using the um, uh, method pairs technique that I mentioned yesterday, so that the code, yeah, there's only one lot of code between the two. They're using identical code to, to perform the same functions. So we have a desktop app, we have a web app, and finally, we have a mobile app as well. Okay, so let's have a look at the, uh, the web app, sorry, the, the REST app. This is the bit that sits in the middle and does the converting for us. So you can see we've got the handle URL event. Uh, you can decide whether this REST web app uh, does actually allow logins or not. So I've got a thing down the bottom here, depending on whether I allow the user to log in, as if I go, well, if they're not allowed logins, then return an error so that the person just cannot even log in even if they wanted. The other thing you'll notice here is that I have a command uh, path added to the URL so that somebody would really need to know what it is that, um, uh, not just access this, this website, but also would need to know the command necessary to be able to determine that it's building a PDF. Okay, so let's go off and see what happens when it runs. So it launches and very boringly, we're not allowed to log in, so this is what runs. And if you did connect onto it, that's what you're going to get. Essentially, uh, sorry, the URL's not found. My my code returns that and gets it as HTML and gets the user to display it. So if somebody's sniffing around the network, hopefully they're going to see that and go, well, there's nothing there. That website isn't able to be connected in. Now, this application needs to be running in the background for the other applications to work. <coughs> so, next one. This is now, so the, the, the REST application is running. We now want to go off and run the desktop version of the application. So you can see we've got um, uh, this external class. That's where all, the, all of the intelligence of the application is, is in. We've got I've put everything into containers just because that's what I do to make life easier cross-platform. But there's within that window, it has the controls and the containers and things, but the code is all inside here if you ever go looking for it. So I'll just it'll jump it'll jump down and show you what's in some of those folders, just so you can see. I've got some common information there. You know, a picture just to show you what's on the screen. I've got graffiti suite in there, but I've had to remove it for what you've got. Just otherwise, uh, graffiti suite would be very unhappy. 
So we have the, some settings there under the tab panel. And if we go off and send, uh, it takes a little while to, to build the Zojo, um, to convert the whole Zojo.com into a PDF. But you can see it automatically launches it and we get a PDF back at the other end. Okay, if we send off HTML, it'll be a lot quicker and there's my web page and you've got headers and footers showing up underneath there and it's all text, it's all selectable. And if we, for example, change it to the same thing but to landscape and ask it to, to as parameters, send that off, you can see we don't have headers and footers we, and it's now in landscape. Again, it's, it's all editable <coughs> now. In this, I'm setting it back again. And let's send a picture off. Now, it does put a black background to the picture. I'm sure there's some way that I can fix that. And a list box, again, nice text selectable list box with headers and footers on there. And it'll just do the same thing, the list box again, but in this case, taking the headers and footers off. Sorry, turn, turning it in a landscape format. So you can see you can put quite a few parameters into your application and get the REST app, uh, web app, to, to take those parameters and build the PDF accordingly. Okay, now that's the desktop. Let's have a look and see what happens with the web app. Should work exactly the same. You can see we've got the same tab panel with the same sort of settings up there the same fields and things. We have the same you know, modules and classes and exactly, it's just their web versions of those. So let's run that and see what it looks like. There are the same common external modules. So let's go off and run. This time it's gonna create a web app. And there we go. So we have the same settings up there. I'm not going to bother doing zojo.com again, so I'll just do the uh, export to HTML. Now on the web, it receives the PDF on the web, but then I have to get it to download it to the user. That's why it, ba it bounces in the corner down there. So let's do the same thing, but this time we're, turn we're doing landscape and turn off the headers. Again, bounces down the left-hand corner. Let's have a look at it. There we go. It's the same report, the same HTML is now in landscape format, just to show that it works. I'm not gonna bother doing the picture again, but I'll do the list box, because that's the sort of thing we usually want to do. Let's open up that list box, and you can see exactly the same PDF. It's highlightable, um, it, it's, it, because it's produced by exactly the same technology on the server. Now all of that is, all of that sort of capability is easy. It's built into the applications now. The difficult thing and the real reason for this is what do we do when we have a mobile app? I can't add a helper app application within my mobile application. But if I do everything on the server, now all of a sudden uh, I'd I can have PDF capabilities. So same things down here, the same external you know, classes, same graffiti suite, but with graffiti suite, we get so you'll see that we, we get pop-up menus and things like that, and we have a tab panel that isn't normally available. So it goes off and builds the application and launches it, and you can see we've got a tab panel up here and a pop-up menu, but let's go off, and in this export, it's gonna send it off to exactly the same rest, but we have to use the sharing capability to be able to view it. And you can see I can go in there and mark it up. Um, you can do any, you know, pretty much anything you want with it. So the same sort of things, let's turn, on, turn it to landscape and take off the headers and footers and do the same thing, see what it looks like. And there we go, it's received it, we share it. And you can see it's in landscape, headers and footers turned off, the same sort of editing capabilities. So let's come and have a look at the list box. Export the list box. We had said uh, that, to, that to have it in landscape without headers and footers, it's remembered that. And, but what we can now do is if we want to share it, we can save it. Uh, we can change the name of it and we can now, to share it with others, we can save it into um, 
uh, into our files application so that we can make that available to, to others. Okay. Now, to help you with your projects, if you wanted to make use of this technique, I have provided 100% of what you have seen today uh, to Christian uh, for you to download and test yourself. The only thing, it even includes the WK2HTML code. I've given that to Christian as well. Cross-platform. The only thing I haven't provided him with is the graffiti suite and also my MBS license keys for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for uh, listening. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? WK to HTML. So, um, <clears throat> it, you, you saw me launch it at the start. Uh, it, because it was an app, uh, a Macintosh web app, I, use, I was using the Macintosh version. It's a, just a command line interface. I launched a, sh it would, behind the scenes, it would launch a shell. Uh, t uh, and all of that code and the you know, included application, all of that's in there. All of, I've, in, in my use of WK2HTML, I've got a, a method set up where you pass it all the parameters. You know, do you want it landscape? Do you want it portrait? Do you want headers? Do you want footers as, as parameters in there? Uh, what do you, what's the page size? You know, in that pop-up menu, I've got every one of the hundred different page sizes that, um, uh, that WK to HTML to PDF supports. So you could have said display it in A3 or A0 or anything that you, you might want. So it, it will generate essentially anything that, that you specify and download it for, for you as a user. But the great thing about it is that the client doesn't have to know what technology is being used to generate it. If I decided to, uh, the, the, the server, like, like my, my servers that I host tend to be Windows uh, 10 based data center um, hosts. Uh, but if you had a Linux host you're running that web app, that would be fine because WKHTML work, works on that. If you had a Mac OS, a Mac mini somewhere running, you, you could run exactly the same program for the web host and your, your end applications don't care. All they need to know is that they use a URL connection to go to a URL and put that particular path in, provide the bits, and it's going to do the rest for you. That is certainly a downfall, as in the internet needs to be on for this facility, this capability to work. Um, there, there, yeah, there is a problem either if your PDF files are too big or your internet access is slow. Most of the time that I'm sending uh, HTML, the, the HTML is very small. You know, you create a, an HTML of a list box or an uh, HTML of a row set, it's, it's relatively small, it's maybe two or three K. That is not a problem sending it up to your web host. Uh, when I do, when I send up a URL, um, it, or even when I'm doing HTML of my web pages, I usually send it a URL, but even if I didn't, I'd probably be sending up HTML which has got links to the graphics which would be online. So again, going up, it tends not to be a problem, even on Snow Networks, because you know, two or three K of HTML going up is, it will be fine, even on a slow network. The problem is coming down. We're not talking two or three K coming down. We're usually talking megabytes of PDF coming down. That's, that's why I gave the capability uh, to just so you wouldn't get too much, a, a bad delay. Uh, it saves it very quick, quickly to a database, tells the user what the ID is, and then you can say, 
come up and say, hey, your, your PDF has been created. It might take, it's, it's 20 megabytes. Well, normally, normal PDFs that I've been creating are maybe one or two megabytes. But if it was large, you could present it to the user and say, hey, you, what you're wanting to download is 20 megabytes worth of PDF. Do you want to, do you still want to download it? Yes or no? Uh, this may take a while on your connection. Yes, I do want to download it. And then it's now grabbing it out of the database. I mean, you can grab 20 megabytes as a field if you want to, but you'd probably grab chunk by chunk. In terms of the help, well, that's already my own, and that's actually on a separate host that I have. To, that all, all it does is look after my web pages. So for that, I don't care how much space that takes up. If if people were uh, creating PDFs with very large graphics and things like that, then that would be an issue, and then I would start charging people according to the amount of space that they store up there. If they needed to permanently store them up there. It is an issue like that. If I did create a 20 megabyte PDF and it goes into my database, then as soon as I download that 20 megabytes to the user, the, once it's finished downloading, it then says a command and says delete that file. That's why I get the ID down. I know which one to, to bring down. And when I finished, I do a delete command. And so my, da my database of temporary PDF files will be relatively small. And uh, the other thing that it does, I, I have it so that it not only deletes it, but it also says delete any where the modif you know, last modified date of, of any of them is more than a day old. If whatever reason they, they have decided to, it, it, they've crashed or whatever and it hasn't deleted, it, it will purge out the old ones anyway. Uh, but yes, if people, if you have a system where people are storing large files up there to create PDFs, uh, then charge them. Charge them for the amount of space that they're taking up. You should be charging them. So the, most of what I do, my, my, my application I'm, the amount of graphics that I have built into the applications that I'm turning to PDF is very small. Um, but if you had an application where, say you, you had a photo library application where you've got you know, 20 or 100 different graphics on your local computer and then you wanted to create a PDF of that and so therefore you needed to upload uh, you, you build the HTML of, of, of all of that. That's going to be a very large HTML file with, the, with all the graphics in it. It's possible. Uh, and that would take a long while to upload. Uh, the other alternative, maybe as you're suggesting, is that you could upload the, each individually the 100 pictures, remember where they are on their server. When you build your HTML of that array of pictures, you're now linking to those pictures that you've just uploaded, and then your HTML is actually very small because it's just full of a bunch of links to things on your server. So that would, again, if you had lots of pages like that, you might want to warn the user and say, this you've d decided to cr create a PDF of 100 high resolution images, this is gonna take a while, are you happy to continue with this? Yes, and that way you can do can do what you want, but uh, and it's completely cross-platform, and it will work on every platform that you choose. But in that case, it might take a while. Uh, WKHTML can handle open type or true type fonts, it doesn't handle PDF fonts as I understand it. So on my, wherever this is hosted, as I said on, I mean, I'm running it here on a, on a Mac, but, and so it can access the local Mac fonts on my, I just install the font on Windows uh, and it should be able to find that font that's installed. 
and most of my editing is in Graffiti Suite HTML editor where I have cho the choice over the pop-up menu as to what fonts you can choose when you're editing your, your invoice and I only allow them to choose amongst fonts that I know that I have on the server. If in your case you allow users to have any fonts that they want, that could be a problem because they're going to have a local font and then when they send it up to the server to be turned into a PDF, it won't have that font, so it'll convert it to Helvetica or Arial or something like that. So yeah, but f fonts are potentially an issue in an uncontrolled environment. Yes? I have not built that in, but if I can do it, on, you know, on a desktop, you know, if I can do it, put that into a web app you know, and run, uh, then there's no reason why I can't send that information up and make use of it. You know, send it up as a, as a dictionary JSON parameter to be able to, to do that. But <clears throat> um, there is no reason why those fields that I'm, I have full control over the JSON that I create and the field names, there's no reason why I can't have a field called uh, PDF password and I can fully encrypt what that password is, turned into base64 so it's not readable by anyone except the web app goes, I know, I know what it is, I will unbat base64, I will do the decryption, I will then add that encryption in so nobody else can see it other than the two ends. So all of what you're saying is completely possible. I just added limited, very limited capabilities in, you know, in that uh, tab panel to be able to set page size. Even, even what they have, I just said header and footer is on and off and so I forced it to to be the date and time and and uh, the that that sort of thing on the um, and page number one of ten or whatever I uh, I've got that hard-coded but there's there's you, you could change it to be the user can determine whether their headers and footers are on whether there's passwords whether there's security certificates there's no reason if you can, why, if you can do it in a normal web app, why you couldn't do it in a REST web app. Yep. That would potentially be a problem. So you can see where the, the, the first time uh, in the desktop app, I generated the Zojo PDF and it was the longest one to, for WKHTML to PDF to convert and it probably took, I don't know, what was it, five or ten seconds for it to generate the PDF and the, all of that was being done locally. Talking to a desktop app, talking to a web app, but running both on the machine, network not involved. If you did have, have a larger uh, HTML or URL than, than Zojo.com, uh, that that would certainly be an issue, and if your limit, your timeout limit was 30 seconds, yeah, you're going to get network errors. Uh, so I got around that a bit, not in terms of the generation. Hopefully, most of the generation will be fairly quick, uh, and sending just the ID back, which is you know a few characters. Um, but yes, that that would certainly be a problem. Uh, it, for, for, so maybe you would provide a parameter for the users to, to set in your application to you know, change it from 30 second timeout to a minute to 10 minutes or whatever you wanted. That, that would be perfect. So you'd have a notification system. If you were doing regular jobs with high, very high resolution graphics, yes, you're right. You would prob if that was your business, then I would say, okay, you, you'd have instead of a, a, an export button, you'd have a submit button. And it would go off and do it in the background and then send you an email, a notification, a pop-up or something like that when it was finished to say, okay, I've generated your PDF. Uh, you know, behind the scenes, here's your ID, do you, and you click the download button, it, and it grabs it that way. 
So yes, there, there will be lots of issues if you are overstretching the system. Uh, the main reason why I needed this is I wrote, a, I wrote desktop apps and I included WK built into them. I wrote web apps which had WK built into them and then I started writing the same app for iOS and Android and went, what do I do? I, I have So I was just going to write this for the iOS side of things so that they would be able to create PDFs and then I thought, ah, if I'm doing it for iOS, why don't I make that capability for desktop and web as well? So I, went, I actually went back to my desktop and web and changed them to use now the, the same technique. And it reduced the, space, the size of my desktop and web apps. When I used uh, WK before I realised that the Chrome capability was there. If I'd known the Chrome capability was there sort of when I started, I think I probably would have gone in your direction and gone on my server. If I can run it in a completely headless you know, uh, shell command to talk to Chrome or Edge and say go and build a PDF, I think I would do the same thing. So I think you're actually one step ahead of me in using the, the Chrome capability to, to build the, the PDF and then I would just do the same. The, the thing I like about this technique is that, yeah, WK was last updated on their site, I think about 2019. So it's five years ago. It still works. I, I have no problems with it. If it does ever break in future, well, I only ever needed to run on my one host. If it breaks on the desktop and web, you know, the local, you know, Windows 11 or, or Mac OS 15 or 16 or whatever, if it breaks here, I don't care. It doesn't need to run on my desktop. It only needs to run in the cloud. And as long as it's keeping on running there, it's fine. But if it does, if it does ever break in the cloud, then of course, I, there's no reason why I can't stop, you know, I will just rebuild that REST app, change it across to Chrome, problem solved, everybody's happy. Excellent. Yeah. So, the, the good thing about this solution, if you don't mind having a hosted app, is that if a better solution comes out, Goldenberg or Chrome or anything else, we can, as long as the features you're telling people, you know, the paper size and the landscape portrait, as long as those are still compatible, then you can swap technology uh, without, uh, without problem at all. Okay, any other questions? Excellent. I think we're just in time for lunch or